A very good afternoon to one and all. I, Dr. Nita Lambe, welcome you all to this international webinar on architectural geometry and habitat, computation and design research in practice. Hosted by Women's Education Societies, Srimati Manorama Bai Munle College of Architecture, Nakul. I think about architecture all the time. That's the problem. I have always been like that. I dream of it sometimes. A Pritzker Award winning first female architect, architect Zaha Adit once said, her unique approach and pioneering vision redefine architecture for the 21st century and her innovative design outlook captured imagination across the globe. Her passion for architecture and her attitude of accepting exciting ways of interacting with the environment have made her firm Zahadid Architects, the world's most inventive design studio. With hundreds of projects in more than 40 countries, her firm has emerged as one of the earliest firms to adopt computation-based approach in design. We are happy to collaborate with Zahadid Architects for this webinar. Our keynote speakers today are architect Vishu Bhushan and architect Henry Luth, lead designers, computation and design research group, Zaha Adit Architects UK. Due to some technical reason and some unavoidable circumstances, our principal, Dr. Ujwala Chakradev, I have joined. I Okay, yeah, have joined our session and now I request our principal, Dr. Ujwala Chakradev, to start with her opening remarks. Madam, please. Yeah, I'm so sorry that I, due to these uh, technicalities, I could not join uh, in time, but anyway, I'm not late. So I, I welcome both the speakers with a whole heart on behalf of my college, Srimati Manorama Bai Mundle College of Architecture. And uh, for Vishu Bhushan, this is not a new uh, college because he was here with us two years ago and he had mesmerized the entire youth of this. There were 700 participants in the conference networking society. Uh, the future of our future is networking society and we had never anticipated that something of this kind would happen and we would be having another uh, conference online and really manifesting the thoughts which were presented in that conference in reality. Anyway, uh, the talks which you both are going to make and the points which you both are going to make is our future is something which the mankind is going to actually look forward to and the architecture is shaping up in a totally different way now we are very much eager we not only me, myself my faculty but my entire staff is eager to listen to both of you and this is just the beginning of our collaboration i'm sure we will be meeting again and again and there will be workshops and the things further on beyond this workshop so welcome once again and looking forward to listen to both of you thank you so much mm, you know, many thanks <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chakodev ma'am. Uh, now I would like to invite architect Sneha Mandekar to introduce our speaker, architect Vishu Bhushan from Zaha Adit Architects UK. Sneha? Yeah. Thank you so much, Neeta ma'am. A very warm good afternoon to one and all present. I, architect Sneha Mandekar, feel immense pleasure to introduce one of our guest speaker, architect Vishu Bhushan. To introduce him, Vishabhushan is a lead designer at Zaha Hadith Architects Computation and Design Research Group in London. He also teaches at Architectural Computation or Patelic Postgraduate Program at University College of London. He leads the design research on computational geometries with specific interest on structure and fabrication aware geometries and the development of software agnostic computational framework to explore it. He has taught at various international uh, workshops and presented at various professional conferences and institute. So I welcome you architect Vishubhushan and request architect Pajanti Yadav 
to introduce our next speaker, architect Henry Lu. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, we can't hear you. Thank you, you Sneha. Good afternoon. We are fortunate to have Henry Luth with us. Henry is a part of the competition and research group in London. He is lead accredited professionally registered in the USA. Since 2007, he was worked on various structures, installations, exhibitions and products globally. Previously, he worked in USA overseeing fast track deliveries and facilitating retailer rollouts. Henry now leads the residential efforts and specially project, special projects with the, within Zaha Architects. Henry's research examines residential domain problems, innovations in digital design and manufacture, and curve crease folding applications. Henry's computational interests include differential geometry, digital simulation and approximation, system design, optimization, digital timber fabrication, and parametric detailing. I welcome you, Henry. Sampada ma'am, over to you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yes. Uh, thank you, Vajanti. Uh, it is our privilege to have an opportunity of collaborating with Saha Hadid Architects a second time. The first being during our Silver Jubilee celebration in 2018 in our international conference, Paradox to Paradigm Architecture in the Age of Network Society. This pandemic period has brought forth a new paradigm in architecture education, that of online transmission of knowledge. And so we find ourselves networking again a second time. Architect Vishu and architect Henry, through their works, have been experimenting with geometry to create innovative architectural forms. Today, they would be giving us a glimpse into the research and the innovation happening in the studio and elaborate on the design process adopted for computation. I would like to hand over the platform uh, to Vishu and Henry for their presentation on architectural geometry and habitat, computational design and research in practice. All the participants are requested to kindly send in their questions in the question and answer window as, as we go through the presentation. So uh, over to Vishu. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, are you able to see? Yes, yes. Yeah. Is it full screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, many thanks for the invite. Uh, we are very happy to be part of the webinar here and present our uh, work we do at the, at the Computation and Design Research Group uh, at Zaha Hadid Architects. Uh, yeah, we titled our uh, uh, we, we titled our presentation Design Play. Uh, it's looking at the computation and design research in practice. Uh, first, we'll give a brief introduction about the group uh, and what the mandate of the group is, and then we dive into the topics of the presentation, which is architectural geometry and habitat. So ZH Code is the computation and design research group inside of Zaha Hadid Architects. Uh, the group is about 10 people, uh, 10 to 11 people now, and it was started in 2007 by uh, Shajai Bhushan, Niels Fisher, and Patrick Schumacher. Ever since that, uh, we have been involved in uh, the mandate of the group is to develop interdisciplinary collaborations across the AEC net uh, pipeline up uh, AEC disciplines, but also with other C, uh, other disciplines such as fashion design, uh, CG artists, uh, so on and so forth. So these are some of the examples of uh, work we did uh, prior. Uh, this is like uh, this one is a projection mapping on a, a facade in a castle in Karlsruhe. Uh, we also develop tech, uh, uh, do design and technology demonstrators. Uh, this one is uh, uh, Nit Kandela, uh, sorry, Kandela revisited in Beijing. And 
uh, we are slowly also looking into data analytics, both at the macro scale of cities, but uh, and also micro scale or sp space occupancy after a building is built. Uh, another mandate within the group is to develop a network of collaborators with uh, academia uh, like uh, like SMM, SMMCA in Nagpur, but also we have ongoing collaborations with the Block Research Group in ETH Zurich, uh, Architectural Association in London, uh, where uh, one of heads or head of the group, Shajay Bhushan, teaches along with Alicia Namad. Uh, we also have affiliations at the Bartlett School of Architecture since uh, 2018 and other institutes where we have been running workshops, uh, but the network doesn't uh, uh, limit itself to academia. Uh, we are also looking into developing networks in 3D printing and robotics, such as strategies, X3, um, machine learning and data, creative coding, and also on the manufacturing and delivery and engineering aspects. Uh, as it's a computation and design research group, uh, our design and research situates in between what we call design and play. On the left side is design where are things which are valuable to architectural design, but on, on the right side we look at computer graphics, mathematics uh, and game design to see what are the computational uh, uh, technologies out there. So it's basically design merging our research situates in the amalgamation of uh, design and design technologies. Uh, we seek to have an historic continuum, so we try to learn from the past, stand on shoulders of giants who have done these things in the past to seek principally correct uh, uh, and pragmatic necessaries and build on top of that. So again, as you can see here, we look into not only architectural side of things on the left side, looking at form finding by Antonio Gaudi, but we also look at uh, mathematicians such as Lionel March to look at the computational side. Uh, all of the group, uh, we also code, so we write our own uh, standalone softwares. Uh, this is because we prefer the first principle. So when you write your own code, uh, you're understanding the first principles better, and that also allows us to develop a framework which can be integrated into the design workflow. Uh, we share a geometry of, uh, we share a language of geometry uh, because it is graphical and visual. So if some code is not working, it is clearly evident in the visuals of the geometry, as well as because it is a transfer of information between different AEC disciplines like structure, structures or fabrication or col uh, other collaborators in the discipline. So we structure the uh, presentation in this way, uh, separated into two parts, which is design and play. Uh, on the design side, we look at the computational framework, tool sets and projects on the architectural geometry and habitat side of things. And we end with uh, on the place side of things, which is uh, our more recent foray into uh, something called as participatory housing and uh, end user participation. So what is architectural geometry? Uh, architectural geometry is to make visible in shape uh, the structure, fabrication and environmental performance. Uh, so these can be geometries of physics, uh, which has a rationality of fabrication attached to it. Uh, as noted prior, this is not something new. Uh, it's historically done by master architects and engineers, uh, such as Sagrada Familia uh, by, uh, in, in Sagrada Familia by Antonio Gaudi. Uh, this is like a hanging chain model, which I'm sure all the architects and students are aware of. Uh, this is Pierre Nervi uh, looking at an analytical way of integrating structure and fabrication. Uh, we also look at uh, engineers from Latin America. This is Felix Candela uh, looking at uh, uh, statics aware geometry and also rational of rule geometries. And Frey Otto in Stuttgart doing his soap bubble uh, form finding or physical form finding with the uh, uh, soap films and uh, uh, fabric. Uh, as noted, this is also not very new, so these things are also can be de design technologies can be dated back into uh, the early 1800s. Uh, this is uh, Bruno Leschi with his design technologies for the how to build the dome in Florence, and this can be seen 
right through and this is similarly in Sagrada Familia using something known as descriptive geometry or rule surfaces uh, by uh, Antonio Gaudi. Because of the descriptive nature of the geometry, this could be uh, further recreated by Mark Burry after the death of uh, Antonio Gaudi and uh, complete the building almost 100 years after the death of uh, Antonio Gaudi. These two examples are also really good in the sense that they have an emphasis on tools and tool making, that the idea that the horse is actually what is able to move the bricks up is the innovative aspect of, of making the dome and the fact that we're making a tool that can allow us to, to scrape the clay in a way to sculpt. This is also the innovative aspect on the side. So tool making also becomes an emphasis that we see early on and it's uh, something we carry forward. Uh, we look also at like fabrication side of things or construction side of things. This is Eladio Dieste in Uruguay uh, doing his uh, uh, brick uh, buildings, but also questioning it and trying to push the geometrical aspects of it. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we also look at a uh, sculpture um, uh, made by mathematicians or artists. So this is Joseph Alberts and Eric and Martin Demin looking at curved crease folding. Uh, it's also explored by other mathematicians like David Huffman, but also at the same way uh, by a sculptor or artist, Ron Resch. So we look at these precedents and all the precedents you saw were like kind of master architects, designers or artists. Uh, with the coming of age of computation and making all of these algorithms available uh, online, uh, it is becoming more and more so integrated into workflows of all architectural firms. So tools like uh, thrust network analysis, which was done by Sheck in 1974 for the Munich Olympics, or the thrust network analysis by Philip Block, uh, particle spring systems by Axel Killian. All of these things are uh, made, made into a design uh, compatible format, so it can be used at an early stage design. Uh, this along with other uh, concurrent research in fabricational rationality. Uh, this is Helmut Potman and Killian looking at developability and rule surfaces. Uh, along with uh, curve coming up with algorithms for curved crease folding uh, on the right is the interactive geometry group in ETH Zurich. But we also look at groups in uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, like Keenan Crane uh, or in Canada to look at uh, the first principles or the algorithms at the base level uh, who are pushing the state of art and then trying to implement that in a design workflow. So on the right is the uh, algorithm to do the curve crease folding from ETH Zurich. On the left is exploring the same in a design friendly environment. Which was developed by uh, us. So all of these tools because of his integration into the design pipeline is actually augmenting the designer intelligence and that is what we seek to do. So any tool or any research we try to uh, do is to try and augment the designer to inform at an early stage uh, things about fabrication, things about statics and more so recently adding other performance criteria like environmental cr performance or view uh, how much of the view is available and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, all of this uh, takes a lot of time. Uh, it doesn't come very cheap, uh, so it needs a rigor in developing a computational framework uh, as into all of these aspects which we just mentioned. So we need to look at spatial structures, funicular structures, all of minimal surfaces, which is looking at the static side of things, but at the same time looking at the fabrication uh, side with 3D printing and function representation or ruled or developable surfaces, curve crease folding, and more so, uh, we are also now integrating machine learning and data driven uh, design processes. But also on the delivery side, we need to think about cost and analytics and how it can be built with uh, a kit of parts which are available in the uh, industry currently. So all of this is a uh, part of our uh, software agnostic framework, uh, which is. Uh, which is at the core is developed as a C++ framework, but then we try to integrate it into the design friendly platforms such as Maya, which is predominantly used for early stage design in the office. 
uh, also more recently uh, Unreal and uh, most of you might be aware of Rhino and Grasshopper. So, but the core framework sits independent of these software, so there is no dependencies on any of any of these softwares. So we write our own code and then try to make plugins which integrates with these. Uh, one such example is looking at trust network analysis, uh, so building uh, understanding the core logic of the algorithm and then trying to implement it in a design friendly workflow. So trust network analysis is used to form find uh, funicular shapes uh, which are predominantly in compression, but you can also do a, compression, a mix of compression tension uh, as you can see on the image. So the pink lines here represent tension and the blue lines represent uh, compression. So this is a video of how uh, the tool is integrated into the design pipeline of Maya. So this is basically all. Another thing we need to look at when we are doing these design tools is to have like a, a very fast speed. So you can do sketches very quickly. Now when I mean sketches, it is digital sketches. So as you're modeling on the left hand side, you are able to get the understanding of what the structure would look like if it is only in compression on the right. So as a designer, now you can intuitively start changing uh, the geometry and see what the, what the impact of the geometry is on structure. So this one uh, is looking at force density method uh, where your color as a designer at an early stage design, you don't have a lot of structural information. Uh, but you're exploring the design space. So here you're just coloring it white to black to change the force densities or you're playing with the boundary conditions uh, and see what the impact of it is on on the design of the geometry. It's a good point that this is, you know, early information, the, the early amount of information available to the designer is not often a lot and it's not an analysis, so to speak. It is a way of thinking through and a way of sort of examining the design domain, but in a non sort of analytical way in the way that we would traditionally think of engineering after we have a form, we then analyze it and optimize it. But this is trying to be more intuitive in a much earlier way to help us explore much faster in a broader domain. And once you have the tool set, you can uh, then you start looking at what are the impacts of uh, on the left hand side are design operators. Uh, so the low poly mesh, you do some subdivisions and see what the impact of it is on the force diagram. So this is and it's also visual. And that's why we look into force density method or thrust network analysis because it is very geometry driven algorithm and you can intuitively make out what is the forces acting on your structure just by looking visually at the geometry. And these are some of the explorations using the tool uh, in uh, a workshop in digital futures in collaboration with block research group. Uh, similarly, uh, that was 2.5D uh, kind of structures. Uh, you can also do uh, trusses or three, uh, a, tr a truss kind of geometry using 3D graphic statics. So this is another another set of tools which is being developed. And this one has a rationality of also not only visualizing the forces as polyhedras, but there is a rationality of fabrication that uh, using this workflow you're seeing on screen, all the elements are going to be planar. So that's a rationale which is added on to apart from uh, statics, you're also adding fabricational rationality into into an early design pipeline. So these are some explorations of the 3D graphic statics. Uh, in this case, doing a straight edge timber elements with 3D printed nodes. Uh, we do also kind of other uh, testing out uh, other tool sets, not only structure and fabrication aware. In this case, it's just a utility kind of tool sets. So this one is to go from how to convert a mesh to a NURBS and seeing what are the relevant workflows out there and testing and coming out with a know how as to what workflow is best suited uh, to go from a mesh to a NURBS. Uh, as noted previously, we also look into uh, computer graphics uh, because of their fast uh, geometry processing tools. So this is a tool uh, which we developed using papers on uh, adaptive remeshing. 
So this one is uh, meshing based on the color. So the red means there is higher subdivision, white is uh, lower subdivision, and you can see and how you can go from a low resolution to a very high resolution geometry. So this is looking at the graphic side of things, but you can apply the same logic uh, into a facade. So this is doing the same algorithm onto a facade geometry uh, in, Chang uh, in, in China. And you can, on top of that, you can start adding rationalities of fabrication. So this is taking a double curvature surface and then splitting them into hexagonal blocks, which are all, which has all planar faces. So you can see all of it turning green. So that means all of them are planar and it can be easily made using a wire cutter or folded metal. Uh, this along with uh, you need to also look into other fabrication tool sets. So in, uh, this is a tool uh, looking at the robotic uh, inverse kinematic chain. So this is again integrated into Rhino and Maya. So the designer is able to test if things are able to be wire cut or not at an early stage and then change the design if necessary to uh, adapt to the wire cutting or adapt to the statics or ad adapt to any other fabrication methodologies. And this one, uh, we are also more recently looking into uh, GPU computing. Uh, this is solar analysis uh, at real time. So while you're modeling uh, on a low polygon mesh uh, in Maya, you're able to get the uh, preview of what is the cumulative radiation on the high resolution geometry. So this is something uh, which is going on in uh, internally to the tool. So generally all of these solar analysis and finite element based analysis need a lot of uh, uh, elements. That means it needs to be a high resolution mesh, but at the designer end, you, it's more malleable to have a low resolution mesh, which you see on green on the left hand side. But uh, so using GPU computing, you can almost re, uh, compute the solar radiation at real time. Uh, so while you're modifying the geometry, uh, you can get to know what is the solar uh, radiation impact or how many hours of daylight are you getting into the building. Uh, sorry for the choppy video. I'm not sure what's happening, but you can see you can get the idea here. So this is a, a tremendous speed increase over what would be you know like a traditional grasshopper ladybug approach in that this is in real time and um, those other intuitive tools we would still use early in design have run times of 30 seconds to a minute to do the solve so being able to approximate or reduce the number of things or push it onto the gpu finding those computational ways to expedite is a way of freeing up design space for the designer to do other things because we are more interested in the design aspects of it, less interested in the automation aspects of this. Yeah, so that's a very critical point, uh, important point like Henry mentioned that we are more interested on the design aspects of it. These tools are just a framework to explore the design or potential uh, design space using using the computational framework or tools. So to explore uh, the research further, we have associations with academia and then we also run uh, like seven to 10 day workshops where we test uh, these computational tools uh, through students. So we have associations with the AADRL and at the Bartlett at Architectural Computation, uh, but we have done also over 40 plus workshops uh, varying from five days to 10 days. So that's one of the roles of the group uh, is through a role of an educator. And we believe uh, in the principles of Joseph Albers, which you see on the right hand side is to learn by doing. So to teach, learn and assimilate. Uh, we learn from the workshops as much as uh, it leads into subsequent research trajectories in the office. So there's always like a feedback loop between academia and research and from uh, and from practice to research as well. So these are some of the examples of built prototypes in a 10 day workshop. Uh, we have done it all around the world, so we follow the same template. Uh, it's kind of learning by doing. Uh, this is a fabric guide uh, uh, guide workshell in Bangalore in 2010. 
this is topology optimized shell in Mexico City uh, in 2013. Uh, this is exploring equilibrium at digital futures in Shanghai. So as you can see on the right video, like students are, there is no glue between uh, on the geometry. So you can see that it, it collapsed. It's just to show that there is no glue or friction between uh, geometry and it is purely standing in equilib equilibrium based on uh, friction. So the one on the left is the actual form found geometry and one on the right I didn't show the final output here just to highlight the fact that it is not glued. Uh, this is exploring developable spatial networks uh, in Cadria in Beijing. Uh, this is using bent uh, timber. And always finding a way to if you don't have the computational tool set. So as you can see on the left side, uh, first to do it manually and then figure out the computation aspect later on. So this is a very important precedence for us. This is how we learn by doing. So you just do these kind of uh, winding of threads and then when you are back at the office, develop the computational framework to do the same. All of these workshops, we uh, try to build the prototype and the prototype involves uh, uh, help from the students. So it's not, uh, you don't need uh, specialist labor. It's basically students building up, uh, building up these kind of structures. And uh, this is in Chennai, looking at uh, curved crease folding molds and cast concrete. As you can see here, this is students lay laying the rebars, and then subsequently. And it's also important to uh, know that adapt to the context. So if there is no tool set for uh, uh, laser cutting in a, uh, this is in Trivandrum when there was no laser cutting for metal available, we had to adapt the workflow to what the context of it or what the tool sets are available. So the work of a laser cutter is kind of split here between three people. One mapping uh, the profile using a one to one uh, three uh, paper print on the right side is the cutting of it and on the extreme right is putting in holes. So once you have that, then this is like a fast assembly. It took like about eight hours to assemble the whole thing with about 20 students. Uh, this is looking at uh, freeform spatial uh, developable networks. Uh, this is in 2015 in Trivandrum. Uh, Continuing on a similar foray of doing stereotomy. Uh, this is looking at hot wire cut blocks in Sao Paulo. Uh, for, first, we need to develop uh, how the tool set to integrate with the robots and then testing if all the G code produced by our tool set is actually feasible to run on the robot. So this is, as you can see, each of each block takes about uh, a minute to cut. So and all of them, because of the planarity, it can be wire cut. So, and then there were about 160 blocks, which took about seven to eight hours to produce. And then again, using uh, students to uh, assemble the overall prototype. So it was assembled in chunks of three first, and then chunks of six, and then putting together the whole, all of the blocks together eventually to make the structure. So uh, another way to uh, we also do is project independent research, uh, something focused on technology demonstrators. Uh, this is the role of a collaborator. So we are here, we are collaborating with industry partners, such as in this case with Stratasys to do a 3D printed chair. So looking at what is the technologies available out there at a current given time, this is already almost five years. So high resolution 3D printing with multi colors, was uh, a technology com uh, new technology coming out in 2014. Uh, so we uh, tried to demonstrate it through a, a chair which was topology optimized uh, for an 80 kilo person. And the colors here is actually indicating the performance. So if it is solid, it means that is the structural force line. And if it is perforated, that means you don't actually need material there. So it's also optimizing for material requirement. Uh, similarly, combining with crafts here, it is uh, stone and uh, uh, 
laying of fiber reinforcement. Uh, again, laying the re reinforcement fiber reinforcement where it is in tension and stone which is uh, performs well in compression is used in compression zones. So this is a collaboration with new fundamentals uh, generally and the uh, AKT2. Uh, this is a dining prefabricated dining pavilion uh, for Art Basel in Miami. Uh, here the tool set uh, exploring was again looking at the network of uh, lines which was topology optimized and is able to build with developable surfaces. So when I mean developable surfaces, that means they're all planar and they can be unrolled uh, in plane without any distortion. So this is the tool set is first to make the beam network planar. Uh, once you have the beam network planar, any geometry which is coming out of it, which is the extrusion you're seeing now on screen, is by default developable. So by developable, uh, it means it unrolls into flat sheets uh, without any distortion. Uh, so there is no, you can use uh, low tech things like laser cutter or uh, two axis or uh, three axis CNC machine to cut this metal and put them, bend them back into shape in 3D. This is one of the version two of the output, uh, looking at uh, it also introduction of lures on the top and some kind of decking. So this was a pavilion for dining. So, so all of the research generally have multiple iterations. Uh, the chair which was presented prior had like two to three iterations to understand the technology and how to improve it. This was a second version of Volu. Uh, next demonstrator is looking at uh, hot wire cutting and 3D printing. Uh, this is Thales, which was done in collaboration with AI Build and Odico. Uh, here we, are, he, we were exploring something called as differential growth. Uh, uh, growing a curve as long as possible and trying to fit it into a surface. Uh, so you can see in the video there were different setups, uh, initial setups and then trying to grow the curve inside of the surface and adding design parameters here to say uh, have higher densities near the boundaries where it is uh, the structural action and reducing the density in the center zones where there is less uh, less forces going through. So and uh, correct me if I'm wrong Henry, I think there was like seven kilometers of uh, lines which was fit into this surface uh, you see here. Seven kilometer toolpath. Yeah. So why we explored this toolpath of uh, of ha having a line is because uh, it was going to be printed on a hot wire cut form work, but it going, was going to be printed by a robot. So the ro here you can see in this video that the robot is doing a continuous path of line and then you're just rotating the form work to adapt to the line. So that's why the line was explored and growing off the line into seven kilometers to have structural and fabrication performance uh, that was the reason why that was explored. So this was eventually done in parts of three parts, but uh, uh, for sake of uh, transportation into uh, into uh, into Rome, uh, where it was displayed first. But ever since then, it has been moving around the world into different exhibitions. Uh, this is look at uh, like how the printing happens. The blue surface is the hot wire cut frame uh, form work onto which it is printed. So there was seven layers uh, of uh, material to just give the structural depth required and it was not uniform. Uh, the structural depth was varied based on the structural performance. And this was how it was assembled uh, on site. And you can see here uh, on the right hand side the form work required for the same. The form work was produced in like half a day uh, in like 12 blocks. It took uh, and then the printing took about uh, one or two days to do the whole structure. Uh, another prototype exploring the same topology optimization, uh, but in this case making them with bent pipes and layering of pipes. Uh, again, the layering of number of layers was dependent on the structural performance. So in certain areas, 
there is only one layer of material while here where there is more structural forces uh, there is seven layers of material you can clearly see it here on the right and it is emphasized or highlighted with uh, having different layers uh, colored uh, in a different color uh, continuing on the candela series this was in 2018 uh, looking at something called the snit candela uh, this was exploring uh, if you look at uh, all of candela structures uh, Although they're all ruled surfaces, uh, there is high requirement to build a scaffold. Uh, in this case, the scaffold was lost scaffold. So this was uh, knitted form work. Uh, this is the workflow is to do an initial form finding, uh, exploring different type of topologies and then rationalizing them to be made into yarns, uh, which could be uh, knitted in a machine. And then all of the form work was then exported to Mexico uh, in a backpack. And then there with minimal framework was suspended in the courtyard and then there was a concrete casted onto it. So the whole of this work, uh, this workflow or this project took about 2.5 months from design to fabrication. Uh, so the design team was situated in London and block research group in Zurich and then the construction team was in Mexico City. So this is the knitting machine. Uh, which uh, we had to lay out the, and this is the all the form work which was rolled up, uh, compressed and put in a backpack and taken to Mexico. Uh, so this, this is Mariana this is whose research it was our PhD research to do this kind of knitted form work. Uh, which is becoming a technology and this is Alicia uh, with her crew in Mexico setting up the base frame and base scaffold. So it was a minimal scaffold which could be removed out. And then the main form work for the structure is actually this cable. Uh, the, uh, the cable net integrated into the uh, fabric. Which was then stretched. Onto the minimal scaffold we had which you will just see so you can see that it's getting pulled into into space. And then interesting thing about doing this kind of form work is to also reduce the weight of the concrete. So once the fabric was there, uh, we introduced pillows uh, where we didn't need the structural depth uh, to just remove the volume of material. So thereby reducing the weight of the concrete. So this you can see the balloons being inserted between uh, uh, between the fabric. And then a special kind of concrete was used to which like a, a fix a quick uh, setting concrete which was sprayed on. Again a research uh, in Zurich uh, which was uh, which had the de developing the technology. And then uh, integrating with the craftsmanship of the local labors of uh, doing concreting with hand. So this this is the local labors working on it for I think seven days to do the whole whole of the concreting. And that's the form work is lost, so it is expressed in the design. So the interior is a uh, fabric and the exterior is uh, concrete. And the pattern here is again highlighting some kind of structural uh, force flow uh, going from top to bottom. Uh, this is the tool. Uh, the other technologies which were explored in the project. This is Mariana with the, on, in when the sculpture was built. Uh, another project uh, where we are trying to apply the same mini, uh, fabric. Uh, uh, with exploring the same uh, domain of minimal surface. Uh, this is the mathematics gallery in, in the Science Museum in London. Uh, it is a fabric pod. It's a minimal surface. Uh, so it it opened in 2016 uh, with a gallery for mathematics. So so we the gallery for mathematics was actually kind of exploring application of mathematics in day to day life, and we used uh, mathematics to highlight the design process here. So the, here we were using a minimal. Uh, a surface which was generated using an equation which was then rationalized to be built with uh, 2D bent pipes and suspended fabric. So as you can see all the equations driving the uh, 
uh, simulation and the rationalization are actually explored. Uh, after the design was done, this became actually uh, an object in the gallery. So it be, it's part of the uh, object list now, uh, not only a sculptural piece, but an object in the telling of the story in the gallery. Uh, one key thing we, we want to highlight here is to make uh, the developing these tool sets uh, and making uh, small prototypes allows us to push uh, back when an engineer says things are not possible. As you can see in the middle uh, part here, the top left is the conceptual section and the first iteration from the engineers was to was the one in the middle. So because we have the tool sets and and the knowledge of building up these prototypes, we were able to push back and some meet somewhere in the middle. And that is an important thing to know. know the know-how is important so we can uh, drive the design into later stage and try to keep the design conceptual design as close as possible to the final outcome. It's a similar thing with the layout of the seams of the fabric. The first layout seam, which you can see on the right, given by the engineers, is uh, it was like a triangulated with a lot of singularity points. But because we had experience of building, uh, doing the same in India in the fabric guide work shell, uh, we could push back and say we can still occur, uh, direct all the forces uh, by using a different network of seams. And this is it becomes more collaborative in that sense. Uh, because you have the tool sets which can interact with the fabrication uh, constraints. Uh, another aspect which we were pushing here was the concrete benches, uh, which was made with hot wire cut uh, form work. Uh, because of the technology, you could allow it allows for it doesn't matter if you're collect cutting uh, the amount of time taken for the foam to cut the foam work is same irrespective if there is minor changes in the geometry. Only thing it cares for is that it needs to be ruled surfaces. So as you can see on the plan here, there were 16 benches. All of them were unique uh, in its shape, but they had the same design system that they were all ruled surfaces. They could all be split into three blocks uh, which were hot. Uh, with foam work hot wire cut and then uh, casted with concrete of about 2.5 centimeters. So this is one of the benches. Uh, this is in Odico who did the foam work and uh, casting with UHPC high performance concrete. So all of these uh, things which uh, the framework and the research developed in academia and techno through technology demonstrators, it's ma maturing fast and we are seeing these technologies now being applied into large scale projects within the office and we have been actively part of uh, multiple projects uh, varying in typologies from stadiums and arenas uh, to metro stations to offices to master plans and so on and so forth. Uh, we can't show any of these aspects here because all of them are confidential. Uh, but we will focus on something which is we are working on as a second research strand in the group, which is uh, computational housing and residences, which will be the subject next set of uh, uh, next part of the presentation. Which are, uh, How are we on time? We okay? Um, OK, so computational housing has been developing um, over the past sort of three years with, within code, um, whereas architectural geometry has been ongoing since the very beginning. Um, next. So uh, th things have been moving in a direction where code has been involved in some standalone projects, but also in the sort of consultancy, consultancy phase with other groups um, to provide certain services, but sometimes to provide certain uh, technical assistance, but also in developing things from the ground up. Next. So there are a number of tools which we've sort of been starting and developing similar to the architectural geometry side of the group. We're also trying to explore the domain design within housing itself. Next. So I'll show a few of these. One such problem we've started to encounter is this idea of how we stack space or how we stack individual units if we are to think of them as volumetric space. So this is one of the ways of delivery of projects is that we think of them as discretized units. 
And why is this significant? Why do we care about stacking? Well, one of the things that's useful about stacking is you might be able to minimize the ground footprint that you actually have to excavate, but maximize the amount of volume or space that you can achieve with such. So minimal um, impact on the land, but maximum total occupation above. So there, there are aspects of, of what Dyson um, and Wilkins, what's being done with stacking and, and what we want to do and implement this. Recent examples by Wilkins and Iyer in Dyson's village, where they're actually achieving this with cantilever uh, with CLT units. Next. So that exploration begins in small steps, sort of digital prototyping in a sense, how we might stack and how we might circulate around this equally useful. Next. But the digital equivalent tools to be able to explore this in real time. So giving ourselves as designers an augmented display on what we're seeing to see if under self weight it will actually hold itself up. So this is using PhysX, which is a grasshopper plugin for Rhino to explore in real time using GPU side computing uh, with some additional just coloration if a stack would hold up in equilibrium next. But the tool set doesn't really stop there. So if it's equal in any equilibrium, we still have to examine sort of load path and if things need to be bigger or smaller next. And so we're looking at also ways that we can visually do this to demonstrate individual build plates within the modules and the amount of force that's transferred so that we can have sort of a bi-directional discussion with engineering that this isn't an accurate engineering process, but it is an intuitive process that will help us to map other tectonic features, whether they're the thickness of slabs or thickness of columns, but this type of thing will, will be more useful if we are able to see it. Next. So in this case, this is just the realization of this stack uh, in sort of a render format. We'll discuss this one a bit later. Next. Likewise, there are tools that we have to develop to deal with sort of long pathways. There's this concept of street in the skies that we hear about from Allison and Peter Smithson and sort of Robin Hood Gardens, as well as sort of long, sinuous, meandering walkways of the High Line. Next. These have been sort of developed as access and public way strategies on a project we're working on in Hong Kong, which is now in the de design development phase to sort of activate a rooftop sequence of meandering between individual amenities and how we think about continuous public ways and how they afford amenity space that individuals can use. Um, next. So the tool set to do this uh, is interesting and almost similar to Talus in a sense of thinking of what is the longest graph that we can make and how do we negotiate a number of constraints. In this particular project, these are the number of constraint or boundary conditions that were presented to us next. And these need to be negotiated to develop a continuous length graph with uniformly or regularized angle sets between them. This is a slightly unusual typology for housing to have a continuous line in this way, but nonetheless, this is sort of how do we bring rationale to this type of thing? We're looking at using simulating and approximating solvers to do some of this relaxation with additional customization on top of it. Next. So how do we do these types of things? So we start from simple, simple steps. So we're looking at the, the floor plan and building this into what become rational blocks. And these blocks are just represented by bay spacings or center line spacings. Next. And these spacings become encoded in what becomes sort of like a bicycle chain graph. And we use this graph to do all of the heavy lifting, which is sort of inside of, of the simulation. I say simulation loosely. It's, it is something that allows us to solve for certain conditions, but it, it, it also allows us some flexibility in things. So the thick lines here are where the cores would be. The thinnest lines are some of like the uh, the units and then the inner wedges are the things that need to be optimized in the system. Next. 
So this is something that carries all the way through down to construction. So the interest here is in making a super rational construction grid that we can hand over and will be uh, we can sort of get to the piling stage much quicker. And you notice it doesn't move a lot. This is an optimization strategy, but it's something that's useful because it makes all of the nodes regularized in the sense that the angles have been regularized. But if you were to move any one of these lengths of the building manually, you would probably fall outside of the lot line or you would probably run into a soil condition or you would probably uh, run into a non regular angle. So by having multiple constraints solved simultaneously, we're able to sort of vet this in real time. Next. This is just a closer look at this to be able to see what's going on. So what's happening is it's sort of taking the input and then trying to space all of the given lengths I want to have for a room, which are the CAD blocks that came in, and then trying to fit them within the edge and the remainder space gets pushed into the node. So you'll notice that all of the magenta or the pink shapes look fairly regular. They have a pointed side and they have sort of two regular sides for windows. They do not look like this going in. Um, so next. This allows us to move very quickly into a construction set out mode. Next. Where we can extract certain features, boundary conditions. Next. Which. Well, no, we lost that one, but this leads to the construction um, set out grid, which goes directly into the construction documents for contract next. So one that was one tool set uh, dealing with sort of uh, simulation. The next one is looking more at how we can look in almost real time at mass and distribution of GFA or total square footage. Next. So test fitting is not something that is uh, it is new. There are some uh, there are, there are many property um, and and other real estate ventures that are dealing with data and, pro and providing services online to deal with this. Prism working with the city of London to develop strategies for sort of rapid housing um, realization within the city, as well as just looking at property analytics. Uh, with Arcastar and other zoning and ways of creating optioneering within uh, tool sets. So this is something which is rapidly growing and is implementing data sets which are online and sort of the Internet of Things as well as open source data to collate them in a way that allows us to see mass or to see distribution of area in near real time. Next. So we're working on a similar tool to be able to do this in in low rise situations. Next. And also in urban tower situations next. To be able to see how quickly we can uh, go back one. Yes, keep it here to to be able to see very quickly how many units we might be get get out of a certain mass, what this contributes in amount of area, how large the individual units would be and to be able to push these in as parameters very, very early on, because what what is very difficult is when given a, a very large area, how to discretize it very smallly into how many units do you, you think I can sell out of this amount of area? Or if the pro forma is not based on that, then what is the unit mix that I might be able to get out of this? So this becomes a very useful tool to quickly not come to a design per se, but to see a massing rationale that would be useful with very little information to start. Next. Along the same lines, there are ways of distributing those units. There are a number of ways to do this. Uh, this is only one such method, but in how we striate and how we tell the computer how to move units around. So this one is just going through and telling it why well, I want to do the biggest ones on on the top of the tower and the smaller ones are on the bottom of the tower. This is in keeping with sellability, but you can imagine a number of ways we could encode in how to distribute the size of unit and where these would want to be, whether they would want to be around a courtyard or whether they would want to be somewhere else. And all of this is based on the idea that there's a center line graph. It's very lightweight and therefore it is editable. We can move any one of the control points and it will sort of auto update and give us the, the, the nearest test fit unit. Next. Yeah, all of these tools are again uh, to highlight here, uh, although they have uh, 
like quite of algorithmic uh, thinking behind it. It is more, all of these are design tools. So in this case, he, trying to come up with like a massing strategy to have a good mix of units, but also to see what graphs type of graphs actually function well in terms of design. So next. So if given sort of 200, 200,000 square meters of space and how to discretize this into a number of units. You know, if we don't know how many units we can get out of this, then the tool immediately gives us real time feedback in how many units we might be able to realize and then also, you know, what that distribution would be. So we could immediately change the number of distribution next and see what this looks like in 3D and start to work with the distribution of this to create pattern, to create, you know, regularity in these types of things. Next. It allows us to get a handle on very large and abstract amounts of space very quickly to be able to sculpt on top of or to give rationale to an otherwise very abstract world. Next. Next. So Vishu mentioned earlier the use of data. I've also mentioned slightly about the use of data, but I'm going to talk a little bit about data as well in that it becomes very useful in not just the design, but also in how we can assess the city and how we can find ways to interface with the city to further densify for housing. So there are a number of remainder lots or snippet lots or parking lots or other lots in the city which might be able to be used for smaller portions of housing or aggregated as multiple properties into a larger property portfolio and usable for development. So um, there are some of the um, test fit people that I've mentioned, Arcistar uh, as well, have sort of been working on this, this idea of global property uh, agglomeration and how we sort of make portfolios out of this, portfolios of properties for resale. And um, so we're looking at this as well, but in, in sort of smaller scale implementations of how we can find space in the city and use it for housing. If we could increase, you know, 10, 15 percent um, densification on certain plots, if it would allow it. This is an alternative strategy for how we can increase housing density without being given a new build site, that the city affords these opportunities if we are to look for them. Um, and they may not, so this particular one on screen is maybe 12 to 15 units max. You know, this is a very small input uh, in the city, but in total, if you were to take the portfolio of number of snippets of the land that could be used, this might be a very large amount that could affect things. Also having alternative methods of doing this is useful um, just in the total number of things that we can deploy in the city for housing. Next. Uh, we're also working with um, ventures like the collective and in, in how we actually use uh, um, operations data and anonymized um, user data and where best use to sort of tune operations or tune amenity space usage or timetables for when certain things would be used next. <clears throat> data is also used in more direct sense. I'm sure we're familiar with solar gain analyses and how we sort of extract this, but what we're doing is putting this directly on top of uh, the geometry to be used for other downstream processes. Next. Similarly, we have heads up displays that we're just sort of keeping ourselves uh, in check with where we are. This one is looking at traversal distance. This doesn't particularly give us a design uh, a, a design output, but what it allows us to do is to check compliance without actually having to check compliance. So visual and regulatory, re reviewing regulatory compliance through visual means as a feedback or a heads up display is very useful um, on our side. Next. Likewise, sort of glazing and facade um, envelope penetration, so how much percentage are we allowed in housing? Often it can be uh, very minimal, uh, you know, like 30% of opening in a wall. Um, in this particular project, we were somewhere between 20 and 25% glazing and how that is perceived in, um, in inside the unit. 
And so we're looking at aspect ratios to collide whether or not it runs into the furniture or not. Next. So there are a number of constraints which we're sort of data mapping here. Um, likewise, we're considering can we see into other units? Are we obstructed from other buildings? Next. And are these views privileged to a certain feature? Am I looking at a water body? Is there a direct view to an activity center? These types of things. They can all become maps which can live on top of the geometry. Next. Um, likewise, this is looking at access to, to light, whether a unit does have a minimum amount of light access uh, on any given day. Next. These encode directly onto the geometry. Uh, similarly, we can put program or the use group. In this case, we're seeing vertical banding of color corresponding to whether it's a core or whether it is a one bedroom unit or a slightly larger or a slightly smaller uh, studio unit. Next. This becomes useful for functional mapping of, of actual architectural geometric features using these mappings to evaluate and then parametrically deploy what be would become either shade devices or slab articulations or column articulations or something within the envelope itself. Next. And color is like an important feature in our uh, tool sets, like because all the data are kind of abstracted into color and then use that color map of RGB here going from black to red to do some design changes. It's the same thing for even structural uh, tool sets. Like if, if the forces acting are higher, it would be red. Forces acting lower would be black. And based on that, that would influence the design output. So it is so this color can be replaced with any data one wants and the design uh, tool set will adapt to that. Next, so another way to think about this in terms of the residential sector is that if we have all of these different types of mappings, what could they be if given every set of data in the world? What would you do with it? And this is often the sort of Internet of Things problem. If you have everything at your fingertips, what is important? So we're looking at ways to qualitatively combine these uh, with criteria coming in from the developer or from the client themselves to customizably look at either price banding these or how you might sell these units, but it becomes a way almost like you were going to buy a ticket to go see the theater, a way of looking at the individual position spaces with, within any building, how it becomes monetized or amenitized um, either way uh, for a particular user whether it is a developer, whether it is a banker, whether it is an end user. So next, so we're also looking at the data side from the fabrication and development end in how we rip these things apart to think about them like IKEA. And I mean that is in, in the sense of how we think about them as assemblies and the complexity of these assemblies. If we are to do something 100 times, but it is the same step, this seems slightly easier than doing 100 different steps, but every one of those steps is only done once. Next. <clears throat> so this type of complexity in the assembly sequencing of things we're exploring on this. In this case, this is a very sort of simple uh, timber box done in a number of different ways, but the idea that the assembly can be encoded in its complexity can be encoded and that this can be used as a way to model or start to model supply chains. Next. So. <clears throat> Why, why is this useful in, in the IKEA sense is also the same reason it's useful in the housing sense. It, it gets us closer in an early design phase to what the material cost might be versus the fabrication cost. And if we were to assemble it, the total cost to actually buy this and send it to site. If we are to think about it as a procurable element, how close can we get to in the early design without actually having gone through the entire design process to give us metrics? So here we can see on the left something which has very few steps but has very large pieces and something which has much more ec materially uh, economically light, uh, a truss network on the far right. But 
it has much more assembly involved. So thinking about this as a scaler that we move somewhere between, it's more complex to build, but it's maybe lighter in terms of the amount of material, or is it heavier and more massive, but there are fewer steps. This becomes useful a way to think about it, but to do this, you have to sort of think about the data behind it and how we can compare these things. Next. Um, as we're moving into and housing the, what we'll see participatory housing, we, it becomes more and more necessary to make transparent the choices in the system tree and sort of systems design behind this. So making choices is actually a, a systems design process whereby every choice has multiple futures and these futures we have to sort of talk about as a group if they're valid, if we want to encode that or not. This becomes useful moving into a sort of gamified world or a world which is uh, real time participation between multiple stakeholders. Next. OK, next. <clears throat> So a few, I'll, I'll try and go through these projects. Uh, um, some of them are dealing with density. Some of them are dealing with particular themes. This is Regents Court housing. It's looking more at low rise stacking. So implementing some of the rigid body physics that we talked about very early on, minimal footprint, residual space within the city <clears throat> and stacking these little small sets. So we end up with four or five total foundations, but overall over 30 to 40 individual units, which can be deployed on a site which would otherwise left as a tennis court uh, within an estate. So moving citywide infrastructure to parks and more public realm and trying to use that for housing demands if there is housing already on the site. So a temporary infill to allow for this. Next. Oh, this one has uh, the next one. So early typologies, this is just thinking about the sort of how we break down what would become a chassis if this were to become a unit. A very early example on our side of this and one which we have further refined and developed and are still developing to this day. This is early, early stuff. Next. OK, yeah, sure. Yeah, so this kind of gives in like uh, also bringing in the customization like each user is given uh, a kind of an option to choose what kind of balcony they want or what kind of uh, end end fittings they want. So this is. Uh, kind of also leads into like later discussions on participatory housing. And part of this thinking requires that we think not about housing as a unit is one thing, but to acquire choice, we have to think about a kit of parts or a number of elements which can be added on to a base kit. Next. So Regents view from the top, looking at how the access is mainly from one side and we cantilever out to the front where the waterfront is next. And the sort of waterfront view. Notice that there are four main stacks. They have very minimal footprints, but we're able to get much larger connectivity by cantilevering out next. Sort of a view from the canal side looking at this. Still very early sketches, next. So increasing the density and thinking about more urban conditions or given a plot which can allow more development or higher density, how do we implement space or implement density without it becoming too dense? Next. So the way that we have dealt with it in this particular project, Tottenham Court, uh, is to um, look at micro courtyards or distribution of micro courtyards as the amenities which sort of space accumulates around and that this is dealt with in a porous way. Next. And we develop comp computational tool sets um, based on genetic algorithms to do this where we have a number of voxels and based on the light we're able to erode from a, a large mass what would become a porous block of potential housing spaces next. So this is going through the, the algorithm, a number of iterations to build up to what becomes sort of the final, the green representing if it has a view onto something green or not. And, and, and so we develop these tools as well in, in parallel to um, the development of the project 
to develop what becomes an appropriate density, but also seeing feedback into making sure that we have views or we have access to certain features that it does not become too dense. Next, for light and air as well. So quick build sequence through each of the floor plates. Notice how regular it is and you know the the uh, bespoke or unique elements of this are in the deletion of things to make spaces slightly larger both in section and in plan but the sort of host shape of this is very similar to a double loaded corridor and it allows us to think about the efficiency of these things at the same time that we're creatively thinking about how to distribute space because efficiency is a huge factor in how we deal with housing and how we deal with getting things through so um, th this theme is not forgotten as we look at at these examples the kit of parts is also you know, being slightly developed in this example, sort of shared courtyards, uh, balustrades, full glaze, sort of winter gardens. So developing multiple choice options on a same base kit unit. There's no real um, optimization or there's no real um, options within this particular unit, but the outside of the unit can be customized in the more micro courtyard spaces next. So a look at one of these spaces uh, from from inside. Next, uh, sort of a cross section to give you an idea of the section on this and how it is pixelated. There's some double height spaces, some spaces which are shaped more like L's, but the erosion of this thing makes it airy. It makes it lighter, and um, uh, this is what makes it uh, increase density as well. Next. So moving more into the urban condition of high density and sort of tower typologies, how do we create mass? In this particular project, uh, um, uh, we're looking at how if we were to sell housing uh, for sale versus if it were rental space, if we had two towers that were developed with very different programs, how might that program be massed differently? So in the rental world versus the sales world, next. So these tend to be uh, also like community based. So in the rental sort of thing, we're looking at if we have smaller communities, whether they are professionals or um, looking at young artists or, or you know, these things are much smaller community sets where a typical sort of sales tower, we would see striation of housing from sort of smaller units to taller units at the top. Next. So the, the typology itself is is already looking at um, how we encode the program into the facade. So, but the facade might be just sort of, um, um, let, let's, I'll, I'll take a step back. The, the facade, while it may be tectonically sort of curvilinear here, we have to figure out a way to regularize certain aspects, especially in the urban or the tower configuration. So this has been you know, an ongoing topic. We, we look at how we look at modular integrated construction. This is a volumetric way to sort of make standardized space or to drop it in place. Um, as one unit, uh, as well as Mushasafti with Habitat 67, dropping these things uh, as sort of uh, walkable terraces on top of individual units. Or more recently, these examples of doing entire kit builds. This is a hotel done with DMD modular for Marriott on the far right, where the entire unit has all of the fitting and, and wet stuff built into it, uh, wet kit built in, and these are able to be put together. So. This is only one way of doing sort of standardization within a project. Next. Likewise, we could look at doing standardization on a smaller size. If we were to do individual elements, perhaps we were doing uh, with, with with Buckminster Fuller working on sort of the Dymaxion house bathroom, an individual pod that can be deployed within the house, or in the case with uh, Matthias Holich in, in, uh, with We Live in New York, looking at bedrooms and individual slumber quarters as things that you shape the unit around, that this becomes the focal point of the unit. Next. So here we see in the project the sort of this first look at what becomes custom or bespoke what we would say and what becomes standardized the column grid 
or the centerline grid or the modular grid if we were to do volumetric construction, that we can push complexity to certain areas and use that area to be the curvilinear or the custom bit now the bit that can be the add-on or the bit that can be customized by the user while to meet efficiency demands or to meet uh, more regularized construction demands we can look to more standardized ways to do this in the background next this allows us to be more free as designers to develop parametric to, to develop the facade through parametric tools. So here we're looking at, you know, using some of those mappings that we were looking at earlier, data mappings to actually encode parametric thought processes into thicknesses, widths, and spacings. Next. And also with slab edge thickness and pro projections and things like this. Next. So space distribution uh, becomes something as well. We want to be able to see this as well in, in the units that the it's not just about the unit as they become smaller and smaller or more pocket living or micro living thinking that we need to be focusing on the amenity spaces as the sort of anchors for how these towers function next. Here we see one of the lobby spaces, which is the gathering space next. And here we see one of the rooftop units that becomes more of a swimming and sort of aquatic and gym like activity for what would be an otherwise much smaller unit set underneath them. Next. So ways to bring people together. Um, I know that this is a, now an interesting topic for our group in the sort of post COVID time and what that means for, you know, how we've been thinking about things a few months ago versus how we're thinking about it now. But uh, still the necessity of human interaction and how we interact with people and providing opportunities for that will continue to be something we explore. Next. <clears throat> So these urban conditions also lend themselves to these peculiarities of hyper narrow lots while still within urban condition. Next. This, so the common sort of thinking in, in historic precedent is in the sort of tenement thinking where you would have these units which have 13 some odd bedrooms, but you're trying to excavate for light, which is not really of a, an excellent way to think about it, both from the quantity of bedrooms and from the sort of well-being sense of these things. So this is an old way to think about uh, space distribution of narrow lots. Next. While the idea of getting space and light into these things is still very relevant. So if we have significantly fewer numbers of units uh, or number of bedrooms, so each one of these boxes represents, you know, two bedrooms instead of about 10, um, and then the distribution of space becomes more porous within this, looking at the light well or the activity center being the stairwell in this case, uh, which opens up onto the ground condition and also onto the roof condition next. That a narrow lot can still be afforded, but still have sort of intrigue in the design just by simply, in this case, rotating what would become the access component. But everything else is still very highly regularized because it has to be to operate in the urban condition. Next. So. I mentioned micro housing and pocket living with this. This is where I'll share a few things on that is that the. Uh, Housing is moving away from sort of the living space and moving more towards the activity centers. So on the left, we see sort of the Kurokawa's uh, expression of what would become a capsule in this sense, a, a sort of modernist uh, way of looking at a single aperture looking out. But on the right is where we're seeing more of the collective in, in, in current contemporary context where we're looking at the spaces where people come together, not the spaces where people slumber and trying to think about housing in this way. Next, that it is about accommodation. So in the housing sense where we actually sleep, pocket living is more about modal living and, and thinking about how we use uh, furnishings or hide furnishings to express what becomes, in this case, the aperture out onto the world, that this becomes the comforting aspect of it. Next. This is a video. But that pocket living 
comes down to thinking about what is the kit that we can make this thing out of and then also not just what is the kit but how do we house or host furniture elements within in this case what becomes a thick wall so the thick wall becomes a way uh, for us to uh, move some of the complexity and some of the multiple things that would otherwise uh, inhabit a space and allow us to look at the features of the actual room being a living room and a modal sort of bedroom for when it's not being in use that if we're not using a certain space we don't need to have it there all the time that perhaps it can be hidden away um, and this is a look at onto this so next a section looking at sort of the thick wall and then the living space next so this is moving more into participatory housing for us in in how we engage users these themes of stacking these themes of of um, amenities and distribution of amenity space are still persisting but we're looking now more at how we can engage multiple stakeholders in real time next so this most next the most recent project is working uh, with Rota uh, working with Prospera in Honduras to develop a kit of parts and a deployment strategy for a uh, housing community on a terrain there next that can also be done in a remote location with local labor using local supply chain next so the sort of creative aspect of this is in developing a kit of parts which is reconfigurable or something which can have multiple futures but has sort of a, a common thread of dna throughout all of the pieces that if you would like to have a unit which lives on the top of a stack you might want to have a special sort of a canopy whereas if you live on the lower end you may want to have a garden or something that opens onto the landscape so what are all of the parts and pieces the kit of parts that someone might want to select or customize in their unit next likewise we're looking at more abstract or legal considerations or contractual considerations that can be um, deeded over when when you so order a unit whether you have continual access or continual view or you reserve certain areas around you for use or later build this is looking at property rights um, or if i have to buy rights directly out to sea next if you want to or you could retain them for later resale so the configurator has provided a, a sort of means of participatory housing in this sense we're looking at sort of an online game engine approach to looking at housing from the site side down to the unit down to the furniture next yeah the important thing to highlight here is also uh, the framework which we have been developing because it is software agnostic and easily be pushed on to the web interface now so it, we, we are not limited by the same tool which you are using in a design interface can now be in a web interface so like the jump is quite easy because of it being a software agnostic framework So this is a sort of quick run through on the, on the last configurator uh, for this particular project where we, we have a system grid, which is basically a, a plat a, a, an XY plane where we're allowing the user to select a certain area size that they might want to have, whether it's tall, whether it's wide, whether it's narrow. And notice there are not 100 features here. We're trying to keep a very select set to make it uh, faster to engage, faster to get feedback, but also to remove the, the sort of reliance on CAD tools or design tools, which while, you know, as architects, we are very familiar with using, if we are to open this up to a wider audience for participation would be less necessary to have. In the same way, if we want to do this on our iPhone, we would want to have a simple interface. So design becomes not also not just about the design of the building, but also the participation and UI to do this as well. The sort of user interface and how we move through a systems design process as a game becomes very important to extract or or, or to get relevant information out of uh, out of these runs to develop design. 
this is like the first version of the gameplay so it is only one one player game where we are trying to uh, uh, accumulate choices of the user but the eventual thought process is to have multiple stakeholders playing at the same time and then there is like a bid or negotiation between the stakeholders to uh, certain aspects such as what type of units or what type of furnitures. So we can it also becomes a marketplace for the uh, furniture craftsmen to also publicize their furniture. It doesn't need to be ZHA furniture, but it can be a local craftsperson putting on their uh, furniture in the marketplace. Yeah, we can run through this quickly. Yeah, with the dog, Henry. Oh. Yeah, sure. So um, these are some of the features of that. They um, it, they're demonstrated in the video you saw before. But the development of an intelligent system grid that allows us to be able to interface structurally next. So as we move into sort of the sort of gamified or online world of this, it becomes more and more necessary to to codify the world in a way that the computer can understand discrete chunks of space. In this case, there's a there is a system grid which is overlaid on top of the terrain and it has an intelligence about it an intelligence that allows us to stack it in certain rotations, in this case 45 and 90. And while we're doing the stacking, we're also looking at some of the analytics that we talked about earlier, whether it has a certain amount of radiation on a particular cluster or whether it has a good view or a more obstructed view. We can count these or or um, metrically quantify and compare what is sort of being shelved on the far right side of this are different iterations using the same gameplay, some which are more contour related, some which are more terrain related, and some which are just more stack related. So multiple futures can be assessed very quickly and they can be assessed on a way which is comparable metrically. Next. So these voxel spaces convert to what we want to get to, what we call architectural geometry, and, and Vishu has already talked about uh, at the beginning of the, of the webinar, in converting something which is discrete into something which is now um, a, a, a geometry which um, expresses spatial consideration. So at the top, we see sort of the core of the building being the lighter green color and an add-on, which would be represented being a darker color. So we're starting to think about, OK, but I don't know what the add-on is, but if I want to add something on, it would be this and it has to work within the system grid. Next. The interiors of this are also sort of um, put into a discrete spatial representation. This allows us to move between certain modules or to transform between certain modules, but it also allows us to look at the stacking in a way which can rotate 90 to 90 degrees of one another. Um, but this same space allocation plan strategy of what's inside a unit and how we have percentages of this with, within a unit is something we're exploring. Next. But also this uh, highlights the aspect of personalization, like uh, how an entertainer, given the same set of voxels of six voxels, an entertainer might choose a different set of furniture uh, or different sets of space planning compared to an young couple. So and this is trying to highlight that aspect of personalization based on a family requirement or a, a, a bachelor or a young couple. So the kit of parts extends also to the site planning in a sense that we have to develop sort of regularized things that can be deployed on the site. Next. And these regularized things are also part of the host geometry as well. So roof objects, we talk about wall objects, we talk about wall with glazing objects, all become relevant ways to take individual faces of what would have been a representative box or primitive shape and turn it into what becomes the architectural geometry. Next. So that variation, as Vishu mentioned, can be um, expressed in a number of different ways and that sort of population mass. We're also interested in being able to, as you select these, to be able to see the, the other 
people sitting around you on on the plane, so to speak, the, the immediate neighbors and what their selections are to sort of build a community based around these choice preferences. Next. Next. So qualitatively, we can look at these these ideas of user choice in a global fashion as well, that if we were a developer or we were um, an operator, a sort of Marriott or Hyatt like person, we may want to look at how we uh, buy, use, sell or occupy space differently. So qualitatively, we may want to assess in uh, close or early early design what uh, are the features of these. This, while it is not showing the data mapping, it is showing where one might perform slightly better than another in certain um, categories and that this becomes useful um, from an environmental uh, perspective as well to map qualitative attributes. Next. So uh, <clears throat> all of this being said, to be able to perform these and to build these things requires thinking about from the ground up how local labor can be embedded into this as a technology driven venture but it's also an economy building venture in the sense that the sustainability of it is based on making sure the supply chains are in place or developing supply chains if they do not exist to be able to make some of these things next transferring technology from certain uh, supply chains to others. So in this case, there is uh, there are a number of furniture outfitters which are already doing mass production in timber and we're able to basically talk to them to make um, suggestions for how to use a similar model for prefabricated or intelligent panel systems for housing. In this case, looking at some of the intelligent systems that can be panelized and then brought out to site. Next. So the supply supply chain of this becomes something we can also think about the data side and how this is useful to provide credibility early on that we understand without actually having the supply chain in place what the parameters would be. So by mapping out the number of steps or the number of machine hours and trying to show them on an object basis, it makes it much smaller chunks of information that need to be digested. And by thinking about it like information objects in this sense, it allows us to uh, attach these attributes in a way which can then be queryable for other things, wh whether we're looking at the assemblies, the sort of sequencing or the cost of these. These are just showing the time factors. Next. The deployment of these becomes um, extremely important, especially in remote and terrain applications where you, know, ha you have to be able to negotiate the, the size of the machinery, uh, the number of persons doing these lifting and such, um, such that it can be done uh, remotely with minimal energy from sort of the remote power stations. Next. Uh, yeah, so we end with like a certain set of images of the, uh, uh, of the proposal. Uh, it's basically a platform for the people to configure their spaces. They can choose what they want. And this is kind of like a overview of the uh, materials which are going to be used using timber and concrete, uh, which are locally available in the island and trying to transfer the technology onto them and uh, build up one. Maybe for the first unit will take much longer to build, but then once the technology is transferred, the rest of the units can be built much faster. So this is like a conceptual sketch of how the units would stack together uh, based on a gameplay of uh, like, uh, how, it, how it would look. Uh, yeah, we'd like to end on that. Uh, only we'll end with a video uh, which we had all the tools we showed here again kind of leading back from practice to academia here is all of these tools are not, not something which are uh, which are locked in ZHA, uh, but we try and keep it open source so, and expose it to students to explore the same tool sets which we use to design these projects so students can explore. And these are some of the outputs which we got from a Digital Futures Workshop, uh, which we did like a month ago. Uh, on that note, yeah, thank you. Thank you. What an amazing work.
No words to appreciate. Thank you so much, Vishu and Henry. Truly remarkable research is happening in studio on computation and architectural geometry and mainly the computational housing. As Zahadit believed in, architect Zahadit believed in having large repertoire, many diagrams to start with and many variations while designing. This legacy of her is being carried out or carried forward marvelously and it is evident to your entire projects. Thank you so much for sharing your research and your project with and the design process along with that with us. After seeing the project of uh, computational housing, I again I would like to share one quote of uh, iconic Zaha Adit when she said, I started out wanting to create buildings that would sparkle like isolated jewels. Now I want to connect to form a new landscape to flow together with contemporary cities and lives of other people, she said. Computational design is not only about creating iconic and exciting forms, but it also relates to the lives of people. It also connects to people and their lives. Thank you so much, Vishu and Henry. As most of our viewers are students of architecture and they must be eagerly waiting to have the question answer session. Now I would like to invite Dr. Sampada and Shraddha, our student representative, to conduct question answer session. Over to you, Sampada. Yes, thank yeah. you, Nita. Thank you so much. Uh, it was truly a very, very inspiring uh, presentation. And uh, uh, it was very educational for, for all of us because we, uh, you know, we kind of got to know what is the core of uh, computational design because it's quite easy to, you know, see the built form, but to understand the process that that goes beyond it. And it was uh, especially, I think, very, very informational for the students because the scale that uh, that was, you know, uh, showed today is a scale that that that, you know, like students understand and they can try to sort of maybe incorporate certain aspects uh, in, in like whatever way possible. So uh, so thank you so much Vishnu and uh, Henry for this absolutely wonderful presentation. Um, so as expected, we have, uh, you know, lots of questions uh, mm -hmm. and even sifting through them is, is, is actually going to be a challenge, uh, but we'll try to see which of the ones uh, uh, I think some of the questions have, have already been answered in your presentation. Uh, so I think the uh, first question that I would like to take up is a is a very intuitive question. Uh, it talks about uh, what is the core of starting a new project and how is the initial idea conceptualized and subsequently evolved into a final product. So I would like to think that because you have shown so many approaches. Uh, so how uh, I mean at, at what stage do you decide what is the correct approach among uh, maybe I'm not uh, getting my vocabulary right, uh, but uh, but you know like from among all of the configurators that that you have shown. So at so how do you decide which is the approach that you would take ahead? So if you can throw some light onto this question. Yeah, so uh, yeah, when we start off on any design project, be it be a stadium or, or a metro station or uh, any any project, we initially there is an exploratory phase where we try and apply a, a lot of different trajectories onto the same design problem. So we create a catalog of iterations. Uh, initially, we have like 10 different iterations, which then get swifted through uh, to five, which are then again pushed forward and then it is uh, it is similar in that sense to uh, evolutionary algorithms, like choosing the best one in a current set and then pushing it forward and adding feature sets which are relevant in other iterations to a particular one which you like. So eventually you'll see start seeing features which, which are in the initial 10 trying to percolate into the final design outcome. So it is not that there's one methodology. Uh, each team has their own methodology. Our team also has a certain set of methodologies within the office, and but our methodology involves this trying. In general, the office explores this way that they create a lot of iterations initially, mm -hmm. uh, looking at different ideas, and then uh, through discussions, through uh, metrics, trying to choose the best one and move forward. Great, thank you so much. Uh, but but I'm I'm quite sure it must be quite challenging uh, 
uh, to sort of you know even uh, like the decision making about the approach must also be quite challenging because you have so many tools in your uh, uh, pilot sort of. Uh, the next question which 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 kind of directly pertains to this in a way is that um, this is from architect Divya from the Brick School of Architecture uh, that uh, and uh, she thanks you for presenting a wide array of very interesting work. And she asks while developing personalization for housing units is thermal comfort considered while simulating or while uh, considering various permutations? If not, can it be programmed? Uh, yeah, on this particular one when the customization and uh, the energy aspects, actually we were collaborating with H&M uh, 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 who is like an energy consultant. So all of these thermal comfort and thermal uh, uh, hmm like water collection, all of these aspects are already considered into the design process and it uh, although currently not exposed into the configurator, it could very much because it's a parameter in the design, it could be exposed uh, to the user as well. Oh, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, I think I'll now hand over the platform uh, to Shraddha, who is our uh, student coordinator, uh, because she can kind of catch on the pulse of uh, of the of the younger generation. Because as Neeta has mentioned before, almost 75% of today's audience is, is the student. Uh, so Shraddha, I I hand over the platform to you. Uh, so please proceed with with the uh, next questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Sampada ma'am. So the next question is mainly software based, Maya and Blender based. So Azhar is asking that what is the role of Maya in your design process and how does it help in stimulating the structure? Also, how Blender doesn't fit in the process, although being subdivision, same in, same in nature as Maya. OK, Henry, you want to take it or? Uh, uh, sure. So. So Maya has historically been a useful early design creative animation tool because it's very lightweight in the sense that it it naturally uses coarse polygon geometry in the way that you would use it for character animation to uh, realize 3D and freeform shape very quickly. And by quickly, I mean, if there is a, a shape comprised of two to three faces that that can actually by using subdivision faces be something much more complex that has allowed the computation side of the group to explore things as well because it allows us to use something very lightweight to explore uh, something which could otherwise be very complex and I think Volu is an excellent example of that that Vishu mentioned much earlier that um, so at in that sense, we we use it because it is very sort of quick to see things and to see things that are lightweight um, and to explore design space or design domain. Um, there are a few people in the group that use Blender, but uh, we have been using Maya. Um, I think it, uh, I'm trying to remember how long, but it, it um, we do not use Blender if that is a specific software question. Um, but to Vishu's point from very early on, it's actually less about the software that we use and it's more about thinking about how we move tools between the different software. So, and a good, a good sort of measure of that is if any of the visuals that we sort of present, if they look like they came from Maya or they look like they came from Rhino or they look like they came from Blender and Often the visuals that we're, we're looking at, it's hard to tell which particular software they might have originated from. And that's intentional. And that's also part of like how we're thinking is that it's more about the design and using multiple tools. For instance, Talus started in sort of a 2D world of pattern thinking and some things start straight in 3D, like the uh, you know, Stratus's chair looking at volumetric thinking and, and multi-density thinking and topology optimization. So they have all very different ways of approaching the design and there's not one pipeline that you can push all of the designs through. That would never be expected and you would never get the design outputs <clears throat> by trying to funnel all of the projects in the same workflow. So we're often making new workflows to to create what we are creating. We may not know how to get there at the beginning, and by the time we get there at the end, we may have found an even better way to get there that we would use for the next time. And we 
That's also part of what's useful about doing the visiting schools is that we're able to explore some of these and vet some of these workflows and figure them out and not be committed to any one software or not be committed to any one particular delivery method. It, it allows us to sort of think more freely about the design. Yeah, and also software uh, is not a, uh, you can explore the design uh, the more, more important thing is to explore design and the software doesn't matter like if a blender can also be used. Uh, we use Maya also because it is like a mesh based modeler uh, and most of our computational framework is on a mesh based so it can integrate with blender as well. So it's not uh, so that's why the algorithms or the base knowledge base uh, framework is more important than which software it is being used, whether it is Maya, Rhino or Blender, and the ideas matter more than the software. All right. Um, so the second question is by Prabhat. Prabhat is XDRL student. He, uh, uh, he is asking that if urban gamification is the future to play and develop cities. Yeah, it could. It is. It will. It, I don't know whether it is future, but if it, it will be one of the tool sets to uh, look at master planning or urban densification for sure, because it allows you to uh, play out different uh, scenarios and see what what is the impact on on the city if you are trying to densify or if you are trying to start a new sit, a new master plan. Uh, what are the parameters which should be driving it? So it will be a tool set for sure, uh, but not sure it will be the only one. So it will be an aid. Uh, a gaming scenario would be an aid. A lot of uh, uh, research has been done in going on to the, into this particular aspect, and for sure it will be one of the tool sets. Uh, but not the only one. All right. So the next question is by Dish Diksha. Diksha is asking that is your work similar to what people like Nelly Oxman are doing at the MIT? And what is it, what is the scope of future for the recent graduates in this field? Henry. Um, so in terms of multi-material printing and volumetric printing, the they they have similarities, and we they share um, certain collaboration strategies and 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 ethos ways of thinking about how we develop design from a material-based strategy. So you know in in Neri running um, you know the, the materials um, lab with MIT I mean this is it's from the ground up thinking about how material directly makes you know the the, the fabrication process without it necessarily being that but we're also thinking about the ground up sort of how the technology or the technique of making is somehow represented in visual form and this we would sort of coin as being if it was fabricated fabrication aware, but in sort of the specific example mentioned, it's more about 3D printing in the 3D printed world. And they have similar sort of like high resolution and in, in terms of printing and her, her you know, current work as well, looking at more glass related technology, which we have not gotten into so much, but the, the idea of resolution of printing and high resolution of printing we can also look at examples um, like uh, Hans Meyer out of ETH Zurich developing the sort of uh, gr digital grotesque grotto and sort of uh, pushing the envelope in terms of resolution and 3D printing and so that that's been something we've been exploring in terms of resolution printing but on a broader sense that the 3D Stratasys chair that you know Vishu talked about is the the highest resolution. The printers were still being made. I think you know they were probably using all, all of the printers available at the time to make that chair when at the time it was created. But Talus, for instance, is a very low resolution 3D printing, right? And and then we're also looking at uh, Vishu has been looking working with people like Xtree that are doing 3D printed concrete. 
which is even lower resolution of, of 3D printing. And so this, the resolution becomes something of interest in the fabrication of these things. Or, and that's something that I think is more of what our group is exploring uh, more so than like high resolution specifically, that in a broader sense, we're interested in the possible futures of these different resolutions as they bear on products or as they bear on uh, building systems. And more importantly, like our research in situates itself in, uh, as noted, in the intersection of design technologies and design. So even though we are looking at the similar sense of technologies, we'll always try to push it in a design sense. Like I'm not saying like even Neri and uh, MIT are pushing it in their own way. Uh, we would try to bring in our brand of design into it. And in the sense using the technologies would be similar, but how it is used to design would be a bit different. Andre. Okay, so the next question is basically uh, to the reference of the future of digitalization. Uh, do you think community housing and personalized homes can act as a catalyst in making the domain of computational design and the use of exponential technology like AI uh, and the use of robotics and fabrication mainstream? So, um, Making technologies mainstream is an, an interesting topic um, that we, I'll, I'll try and unpack that from the other, which is uh, sort of the housing part of it, is that, for instance, with the visiting school prototypes and demonstrators that we're working on, we're trying to explore very quickly how to realize certain design and to make it more accessible to more areas in the sense that a free form shape may look rather um, scary looking until you are able to understand it is actually only made of shapes that you could trace on 2D sheets. And as soon as you can make that jump that this thing is actually just a bunch of special cut sheets, that it becomes accessible to a much, much broader audience. So making something fabrication rational earlier on makes it um, more open to uh, consumption in, in in the world. And you know, th this is going to take some time. We're already seeing some things come down like with uh, hot wire cutting and robotic hot wire cutting Im implementation of robotics to bring down sort of form work costs. Um, um, but you know, making things mainstream, takes time and it takes sort of industry disruptors and innovators and entrepreneurs to bring competition into the market where it might not have existed before. And we this is one of the reasons that we try to collaborate with startups and we collaborate with all sorts of disciplines is we are not always aware which ones might go mainstream or not, so we try to diversify as much as possible so that we can try to make it mainstream. It's almost like a numbers game. So, you know, how many persons um, that, that are doing this particular technology path, we, we want to get to know them, you know, so that we can find ways of making it mainstream. This is a goal. If it's not mainstream, we want to move it mainstream. There is not a desire to keep it avant-garde. Uh, the technologies that is. So if if we were to talk about the housing side of this in the efficiency side of housing, at the moment the way that we're making it mainstream is the, the idea that we're thinking about the standardized parts of housing or the efficient parts of housing or the unitized parts of housing being you know standard or modular or fairly mainstream in how you would procure them. So you could procure a volumetric piece or something which is orthogonal or you're buying shapes which can be sort of pre-cut. But the bespoke pieces, the add-ons, the sort of 10% extra, that thing which is customizable, that moves the complexity to a much smaller amount of the project in a way that it does not necessarily require mainstream consumption to do that 10%. But if you can do the 90% or 80, 90% of the project with mainstream um, processes, 
then that's a real big win. And that's the only way at the moment that housing can sort of compete at this level is to be able to be super efficient with everything and and, and have the customization move to limited aspects which are highly visual, um, but from a percentage standpoint, are much less of the scope of the project. So that when we talk about modular uh, bespoke, this is what we mean, that it's sort of an 80-20 kind of thing, and that's how we interface with the market. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, we have actually um, questions still pouring in, uh, but I guess we'll have to uh, kind of address the last uh, couple of questions now. Uh, so if it's OK with you both, uh, shall I? Uh, I think there is one very interesting question uh, which asks about uh, what are your thoughts? It's from Priyanshi. Uh, what are your thoughts on biomimicry in architecture uh, design research? And is that taken into consideration uh, in your kind of approach of, of design? Mm -hmm. So I think I, I, so I'm going to unpack the, the biomimicry term because um, I think there are some useful parts of what that you could think about. And so, for instance, if we're talking about it in sort of the Julian Vincent sense of like if shape morphs can be scaled and this this type of discussion that the morphology of shape and the typology of shape being based off of a genotype and leading towards phenotypes, that's this is absolutely something which we are using. It's not a direct interpretation of I think how you might interpret biomimicry, but it is an interpretation that has been used for how shape and shape grammar comes to pass and how lineage of object is passed from a sort of host or a parent down to a child. And that is certainly something about how we develop optioneering and how we develop morphologies on a theme that we carry through. Um, in the same sense, we're using this uh, this idea for, um, you know, on on not in the natural world sense, but in the how we encode natural processes. So Talus is a great example of this in approximating simulation uh, processes that the natural world has so many different ways of 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 making shape, of making form. Fry Auto, we point out a few of these with like the making of, of soap films. This isn't exactly, I think, what you would call biomimicry, but in terms of shape making, it is a natural process. So similarly with Talus, the sh sort of shape making in that is based on a natural process of diffusive growth. And this is an approximated simulation, a computational tool. So we are often looking at ways to encode approximated natural processes or best guesses or early ways of thinking about natural processes to explore that design language. So tell us there are multiple ways to look at that growth pattern of the shape. The idea that it is grown through a computer, not grown in the real world, is fairly semantic, but the idea that you're using natural processes as the guide for shape making is what sort of is behind both biometric processes and approximating what in that case was a computational process. Um, so I think they're overtones, but the but the term itself, um, you know, we I think I would phrase it in these two ways that we use it from the natural processes standpoint, but also in the idea of morphology and lineage of things being replicants of of a sort of parent child. Yes, thank you, Henry. I think the question comes comes quite naturally because uh, the product it it does look very you know sort of organically inspired. So I guess that's uh, that's a very natural question that would come to anyone's mind. Um, I would like to go uh, to the last question. We, we still have, have questions coming in. I request all the participants that we have floated a feedback form where we uh, have given you scope to input your questions. So if so for all of those of you whose questions have not like we, we unfortunately can't get to, could you please put them uh, you know in uh, in that feedback form and, and then we'll have all of the questions forwarded to Henry and, and Vishu for their perusal. Uh, so the last question which I think is a is a you know a question that is on the minds of every architect and it is something that that is being talked about constantly nowadays is that uh, uh, you know is there a correlation between i mean vernacular how does how does vernacular architecture configure 
uh, into this approach of computational design does it does it not is there you know like a middle ground uh, between both um, is there a balance that is possible yeah there is always a balance which is possible and uh, all your design and tools sets have to adapt to a given context so if you know what the technologies are available when you're starting to design you can integrate them and you should integrate them into uh, try and abstract those things into a computational logic and explore them in your design so it doesn't need to be super accurate when you're exploring the design space and this is something we keep on referring to within within the team when you're doing uh, doing the early stage design it needs uh, the tool sets that need not be really very accurate it should be credible and if you can abstract the logic of whatever you call vernacular uh, into simple rule sets and uh, try and incorporate it into your design uh, workflow then you're already exploring the domain space in that particular vernacular context you set up so it it should be it is possible and it should be adapted like the design technologies which are available in a given context is what should be used to drive the design as well great thank you so much vishu and thank you so much henry uh, although i i would love to continue with the questions uh, but i think for uh, today we uh, uh, could could end uh, the question part here thank you shraddha for your uh, coordination with the uh, you know student uh, population i now hand over the platform uh, to neeta to wind up today's very very interesting uh, session that we had uh, over to neeta yeah before that yeah we would like to thank all the participants i don't know how many attended eventually but uh, who were it's like a weird setup because I'm, we are not able to see yes. who, who we are addressing so whoever tuned in uh, many thanks for listening in and hope uh, it was an interesting uh, discussion i think we had around uh, 300 to 350 who were able to log in some had some technical issues but but our technical team was constantly at work trying to resolve it um, we will finally get to know the figure but around 300 350 is is the estimate so okay. uh, thanks to everyone who attended <laughs> yes uh, neeta uh, neeta could you come online to uh, wind up the proceedings yes Thank you, Sampada. Thank you, Shraddha. Very interesting discussion is going on, but we need to end it here for today. Vishu and Henry's work is true to their founder's vision. There are endless possibilities and ideas associated with computational design approach. On behalf of SMMCA, I extend sincere thanks to Zaha Hadid Architecture, here, Zaha Hadid Architects, and lead designers of Zaha Hadid Architects. Architect Vishu and Architect Henry for sharing their amazing work. I am sure students would definitely love to hear you again. And of course, we would again would like to collaborate with you. Thank you so much. We are grateful to our management and Dr. Shamla Nair, Secretary and Director of Women's Education Society for her support in all our activities. We would like to thank our principal, Dr. Ujwala Chakradev for her constant support and encouragement. We would like to thank all of our participants for their over, overwhelming response. Special thanks to our students coordinator Shraddha and our technical team members Vaijanti and Sneha for their hard work in smooth conduction of this webinar. As I said, Vishu and Henry's work is true to their founder's vision. Truly said by the legend Zahari, there are 360 degrees. Why stick to one? And I'm sure all viewers of this webinar could not agree more to this or more to her work. Thank you so much. Be happy. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Vishu. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Yeah, just a Thank correction you. there. It is not our own work. It's a teamwork. So there are other people in the team who are working. So, yeah. so. <laughs> yes. thanks. Very true. Thank, Thank you so much, Henry. Thank so you so much. Thanks.